This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Something that I've noticed lately is that certain astronomical events are getting tons of news coverage and create this kind of hype machine around them, when in reality, sometimes the astronomical event they're talking about just isn't that interesting to actually see it in person or to photograph. So I think maybe it's, you know, sometimes these things are interesting conceptually, so they make good stories. But there's a difference between astronomy that's interesting to read about uh, and because conceptually there's, you know, something interesting about a certain star and it's, uh, you know, it's physics or something. But and there, there's a difference between that, the like a conceptual thing that you like, you know, read a news story about or read about in your favorite astronomy book and this kind of astronomy that really blows your socks off at the eyepiece or with a camera or just naked eye under the night sky. And on one hand, you know, if the news agencies want to spend time talking about astronomy at all, that's awesome. I'm all for it. But uh, the information in these articles and TV segments, it, you know, it's usually pretty decent. You know, it's, it's not that bad at giving you sort of the basic information. I'm really not trying to rag on journalists at all here. My worry is more with how they package it, you know, to get uh, clicks. And I mean, I'm sure I, I know about this because I have to package these videos to get clicks too. Um, but I know that many people just glance at headlines and images today, especially with social media. So like, look at the, the headlines and the images for the Blaze Star. Uh, so, you know, these are articles that have been circulating lately. And all these images that are sort of like leading the article are either artistic renderings or I expect these days probably AI created images. But I think that many might think just seeing an Im image like this with, you know, this headline that we're <laughs> about to actually see something like that in our night sky. So well, the tr truth is, which I'm sure m many watching this channel know, is that the blaze star is a, you know, a recurrent nova in Corona Borealis. It's predicted to get maybe as bright as Polaris, the North Star, which is a moderately bright star in the sky. But that's all that's going to happen visually. It's at it's, it's some point soon, they predict, uh, this star th that... Right now is so dim, you need a telescope, or maybe maybe in under a dark sky you could see it with binoculars. But anyways, it's dim. You can't see it naked eye. A star that's very dim is then going to become bright enough to see naked eye for a few nights. And so it's going to be a lot of fun, you know, to point out to people when this happens uh, and explain what a recurrent nova is. But it's not going to make for an impressive photograph. It's not going to be the kind of astronomical event that I think would convert people from being like not interested in astronomy to becoming amateur astronomers. It's more like the kind of thing that existing amateur astronomers will geek out about and, uh, you know, have fun talking about for a week and, and documenting. So that's just what I think is sort of interesting about the current, uh, you know, news situation. I saw the same thing happen with this so-called green comet in January 2023. Uh, I don't know, you know, most comets have this green uh, sort of look around the nucleus. So it's funny that they call it the green comet. And they, they really hyped that comet when it was really just a fairly normal, not particularly bright or interesting comet. Um, you know, now, all comets are interesting to astronomers and to astrophotographers like me, but the amount of attention the media was giving it made it seem like, oh, this is the next great comet, <laughs> like hail bop. One, you know, a great comet meaning the tail is clearly visible to the naked eye, uh, which this one just wasn't at all. And I hope that people don't, you know, swear off amateur astronomy because they go into certain astronomical events thinking they're going to look a certain way based on like the media reports and then finding the actual experience very different, perhaps underwhelming or frustrating. So that's where I'm coming from with making this video, but now I'm gonna have some fun. I'm gonna share my personal rankings for these different astronomical events uh, that you know the media likes to talk about and how much they live up to the hype through my eyes. So this is purely subjective. My opinion will probably differ from yours. It's perfectly okay. I just thought it might be interesting to compare these since I've seen and photographed many of the bucket list events like, you know, comets, of course, uh, eclipses, all the different kinds. 
transits, conjunctions, meteor showers, aurora. I think that's it. Uh, so anyways, here's my how my ranking is going to work. So for each kind of event, I'm going to rank it twice. Um, once for visual impact, so just you know what you can see naked eye or maybe with binoculars, and once for photographic impact, so what you can do with uh, a camera. Um, and I'll rank on a 10-point scale with 1 being doesn't live up to the hype at all and 10 being fully lives up to the hype and exceeds my wildest expectations. Okay, so let's start with comets. Um, when I say comets, uh, I'm talking about your average comet. I'm not really talking about like great comets like hale -Bopp, where, uh, you know, the once in every 30 years kind of comet where you could see the tail even from a city sky. I'm talking more like uh, the comets we get a lot more often, like 13P Olbers that is in the sky right now in the constellation Ursa Major, I believe, tonight. Um, you know, 13P Olbers right now, the nucleus has an observed magnitude of about seven. So not something you'd be able to see from a super light polluted area like a city, but no problem spotting it from a suburban to rural area, a moderately darker sky. Um, but what does a comet like that look like through binoculars or a small telescope? It looks like a fuzzy, slightly greenish blob, <laughs> you know, a little bit bigger than a star. And that's what most of them look like. I've seen maybe eight or nine comets at this point, and most of them look like just like a little fuzzy uh, greenish blob on the sky. Neowise in 2020 um, was a little different because it, it was getting pretty close to being a great comet in brightness, and uh, you could definitely see some really nice detail even in the tail through binoculars. So I spent many nights uh, just observing it, just observing Neowise, not photographing it. So visually, I'd put comets as a category, like a three. Most of them, <laughs> I think, are like a three, but if if, if all the comets were more like Neowise, I'd, I'd put that much higher. I'd put it like a seven or something. Because uh, I, I thought that was a very cool comet just to visually inspect. Photographically, I'd put comets quite high, like an eight. Um, I just find them very fun to photograph. The tail of a comet is constantly changing from night to night. Even hour to hour, you can sometimes see uh, differences in the tail. Um, so they're a very dynamic subject, which makes them a lot of fun. And I'd also say they're difficult to photograph well. You know, they're, they're easy enough to just get like a quick snapshot of, but to photograph them well, to really bring out the tail, it's quite hard. Um, so in, in my book, that makes them even better because I like challenging myself with astrophotography and comets are always a challenge. Okay, next up, we have the total solar eclipse. And this one for me is easy and I might surprise you. For this total solar eclipse, I'm giving this one a 10 for visual experience and a 5 for photography. And the reason that may be surprising is I did a whole series on photographing the last total solar eclipse, and I personally brought many setups to photograph it myself, and I do enjoy photographing it. But I will say that the photographs themselves just really disappoint me because they just really can't compare to seeing totality with your own eyes. Um, it, I'd actually put it even higher than 10 if I could. It For me, it fully lives up to the hype and just far exceeds it. Both eclipses, total solar eclipses that I've seen, 2017 and 2024, just blew me away. So, and once you've seen one, you'll probably get why there are these eclipse chasers that just travel anywhere around the world to see totality again, because it's really in a league of its own in terms of visual spectacles, not, not just astronomical uh, events, but any kind of visual spectacle. I think total solar eclipse is right at the top. So I don't know how to really describe it. Uh, I'll, I'll just wrap up by saying, you know, the photographs don't do it justice. You really got to see it in person. It's one of those things. Okay, but what about a total lunar eclipse? Um, these are fun, um, but both visually and photographically, I'd put them at a four. Uh, maybe your, if it's your first one, it might be a little bit higher, but then I feel like they get a little old hat. 
Uh, the fun thing for me, though, uh, through both binoculars or a camera, is you can see the stars and the moon at the same time. So usually the bright glare of the moon washes out any stars around it if you're really zooming in on it with a, a camera or a uh, binoculars or telescope. So that's my favorite thing, is you can see stars really close to the moon. Um, and then that, and then you can also look for impacts of asteroids hitting the moon's surface during the eclipse. So that's fun too, especially if you see one live. Um, and then partial eclipse. I'm going to just lump all partial eclipses together. I know that there's, you know, obviously differences between a partial lunar and a partial uh, solar, but I don't like any of them. <laughs> I give them a two visually and a two photographically. They're just not really that interesting to me and they all feel sort of the same. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm just spoiled by total eclipses, but I just can't really get excited about partials. Okay, moving on to transits. And this is when one object, I think in all cases I'm talking about a solar system object, passes in front of another solar system object. So the foreground object could be the International Space Station, which can transit both in front of the moon and the sun, or it could be other large satellites in low Earth orbit, like uh, Hubble or the Chinese Space Station. Um, and then we also have inner planets of our solar system transiting the sun. So uh, those are a little rarer. The next Venus transit isn't for a good long while. The next Mercury transit will be in 2032. I captured the last one in 2019. So sometimes they're spaced pretty far apart. And I'll give transits as a category a five visually and a six photographically. I think the most fun thing for visual is, is the ISS transits, which you can look up on transit-finder.com. And I think what's so fun about it is them how quick they are. You know, it's, it's really a blink and you'll miss it type situation. So the, the best way to capture it, um, other than just seeing it, is, is either with video or a high-speed burst mode. And you don't need really fancy equipment for a transit, um, at least not for a basic pictures like the ones I've done. I, I did transit photography very early on in my astrophotography journey. Um, but the, the reason I'd give uh, this a six photographically is you can really specialize in this and get really awesome transit shots. You can get much more detailed things. You can look up like Andrew McCarthy is a master at this. All right, and then conjunctions are just when two objects get close to one another from our vantage point, like a planet being close to the moon or two of the planets getting close to one another, things like that. So the last uh, very memorable one was the great conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn in December 2020. Actually, I think there was maybe more recently a conjunction of Mars and the moon. I didn't capture it, but that could be cool too. But anyways, using the Jupiter-Saturn one as a baseline, I'd say they're around an eight visually and maybe a four photographically. And this one I might be wrong on. I haven't done that many. Maybe planetary photographers would really disagree with me on this. Meteor showers, I'm actually going to rank pretty high. I'll do an eight on visual and a seven on photographic. Um, but I have to give uh, <laughs> some conditions on those ratings because meteor showers like comets are sort of unpredictable. Um, you really have to get the best conditions, but also even just year to year, any given meteor shower, it's going to be different every year. Sometimes you'll get a really great shower and sometimes it will be a little lackluster. But then you also have to really get the timing right to have the full impact because you want the meteor shower to line up with the new moon and you want a very dark sight. But when everything works out, it is pretty magical just to lay back and see dozens or sometimes hundreds of shooting stars in a few hours. It, it's, I know it's my earliest astronomical memory is seeing a meteor shower. Uh, I, I think probably before I was 10, I saw one. So I think it's a special one for me, something that really sticks in my mind. Um, and what I like about them photographically is uh, since I'm a deep sky guy, you can really do cool, I guess, conjunctions where, you know, the meteor is in the foreground or is that a transit? I don't know. But anyways, you can, you can get these cool, uh, things to line up where you get a, a lucky shot of a meteor and then some deep sky objects all in the same shot. And I think that looks really cool. Like here's one I got uh, with the Perseids. You can actually shoot Orion 
right before sunrise, and that's how I got this shot. Okay, and then last but not least, the aurora. For me, this is personally important photographically because it's how I got hooked on astrophotography. Uh, photography, time-lapse filmmaking, those were all my hobbies, but I decided I wanted to see the aurora and photograph it, so I took a trip to Iceland in 2014, of course, bringing all my different gear, all my different lenses and DSLR and all that stuff. I was very, very impressed by the Aurora visually. I'd give it a seven um, if you get it on a good night, but photographically, I was just blown away. It, I was, it was some of my favorite shots I'd ever taken. It's what really got me into Astro. I just loved this juxtaposition of the stars and the Aurora and the landscapes of Iceland at night uh, with the snow, you know, uh, lit up a little bit by the Aurora. And without even knowing much about night photography, I was still able to take really cool shots. It's a very accessible way to get into astro, and I was so happy that many people have now experienced this because of the really awesome Aurora shows earlier this year, um, both here in uh, the U.S. and Canada, but also over in Europe and the U.K., um, so I, I just saw that there were so many people finding they could take awesome images just with their cell phone of the Aurora, and it was so cool. So I'd give the Aurora a nine photographically. I think it is fun for beginners, but it also just never gets old. So that's my ranking. <laughs> but tell me, you know, what, what astronomical events did I forget about that I should have included in this ranking? And what do you agree with me on? What do you disagree about? When you've taken all these photos of astronomical events like me, what do you do with the photos? Well, I'd suggest creating your own website with your own portfolio of images that you have complete control over and Squarespace makes that super easy with their design system called Squarespace Blueprint. You can choose from several different professional templates and then of course you can customize them quite easily as I'm showing here. There are lots of features built into Squarespace. So for example, if you wanna sell products or prints or services, you can set up an online store with, you know, right in Squarespace's backend. And Squarespace now has flexible payments, which include Stripe, PayPal, Apple Pay, credit cards, Afterpay, and Clearpay. So your customers, they can pay any way that they want, however it works for them. And really any kind of website that you wanna make, whether you own a small business or you are just a photographer like me and you want a, a portfolio of your images, Squarespace has you covered. And if you head over to squarespace.com slash Nebula Photos, you can sign up for a free trial to check it out. And then when ready to make a purchase of hosting or a domain, you can get 10% off with code Nebula Photos. Till next time, this has been Nico Carver, Clear Skies.